Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. We're going to wait uh, just a couple of more minutes, and then we will get started. Great, I think we are ready to get underway. Uh, so thank you very much everyone for joining us this morning uh, for this webinar on Voting for Decent Work 2019 Key Vote Preview. My name is Shannon Rohan and I'm the Director of Responsible Investment Leadership at SHARE. We are very excited to have received such a high level of interest for this webinar and would like to acknowledge the ongoing support for our Valuing Decent Work initiative from the Atkinson Foundation and also acknowledge their leadership in putting decent work on the agenda of companies both in Canada and globally. I also want to acknowledge the support provided for this webinar from Van City. Uh, it is great to be doing some work with a fellow uh, certified living wage employer uh, around decent work. So thank you uh, for that ongoing support. Uh, I'm very pleased to have two of my colleagues with me today. Uh, Delaney Gregg is the Manager of Shareholder Engagement and Policy at SHARE. Delaney leads engagements with Canadian and global companies on a range of social issues, including human rights, Indigenous rights, and decent work. Uh, and my colleague, Hugues Le Tourneau, is the Manager of Responsible Investment Leadership at SHARE, and he also runs the Secretariat for the Committee on Workers' Capital. Uh, Oog leads a number of SHARE's engagements addressing labour and supply chain issues at both Canadian and global companies. So the purpose of the webinar today is to provide you with background information about key upcoming votes related to decent work. These votes provide shareholders with a very important opportunity to demonstrate support for stronger corporate management of and investment in decent work. So, some housekeeping issues before we begin. Uh, you will be in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. We have reserved the last 10 minutes to take questions from the audience. Due to the large number of participants on the webinar, we ask that you submit your questions through the chat box function located in the webinar panel on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. We encourage everyone to send in questions throughout the presentations, uh, and please also indicate if your question is directed to a specific speaker. If there are questions that we don't get to on this call, we will follow up after the webinar by email. The webinar is being recorded and will be provided by email to all registrants and also be available on our website at www.share.ca. So before we dive into the topic for today, I wanted to provide some background to SHARE for those who may not be familiar with our organization. SHARE is a nonprofit organization dedicated to mobilizing investor leadership for a sustainable, inclusive and productive economy. Through a collaborative model, we provide shareholder engagement, policy advocacy and proxy voting to a network of over 100 organizations with more than 22 billion in assets under management. Our network includes pension funds, universities, foundations, religious investors, trade unions and asset managers, many of whom are on the call today. So thank you for your support. 
SHARE also supports responsible investment leadership by boards of trustees and asset owners through research and education on key and emerging sustainability issues. Shareholder resolutions are just one of the tools we deploy in our efforts to improve corporate sustainability policies, practices, and outcomes. Throughout the year, SHARE's team is engaging with over 80 companies, both on our own and in collaboration with other investors globally, on topics such as climate change, indigenous rights, executive compensation, and diversity, to name a few. But today, we are talking about our efforts promoting decent work. Oh, I should also mention that we try our very best to practice what we preach. SHARE is a certified living wage employer and Canada's only unionized responsible investment service provider. So, to start off, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we mean by decent work. Decent work, as defined by the International Labour Organization, involves opportunities for work that is productive and delivers a fair income provides security in the workplace and social protection for families. It provides better prospects for personal development, freedom for people to express their concerns, freedom to organize and participate in decisions that affect their lives. And it also provides equality of opportunity and treatment of all people. So based on this definition, SHARE identified five key dimensions of a corporate decent work strategy. And that's what you'll see here on, this, uh, on the slide. The five dimensions are providing fair wages, respecting workers' rights, valuing workers' input and contribution, investing in workers' growth and development, and creating an inclusive and stable work environment. And this really frames shares engagement with company and uh, focusing on these five th dimensions. And the other aspect of our work uh, engaging with companies is really seeking better disclosure from companies about their workforce practices. The ongoing challenge we face as investors, particularly in the area of decent work and human capital management, is a lack of meaningful information from companies. Generally speaking, although there are important exceptions, the disclosure we get from companies on their workforce is pretty thin and largely descriptive. And in their financial reporting, workers are often treated almost exclusively as costs, costs to be minimized rather than assets to be protected and invested in. At the same time, current disclosure tends to provide us with only a glimpse of a company's employment footprint. So we might get information about a company's senior level staff, for example, or only their full-time or part-time employees. But this leaves investors with a lot of blind spots particularly in the context of shifting labor markets and the growth of different kinds of employment relationships, including temporary workers, contract workers, and franchise models, among others. And this is often referred to as either precarious employment, the growth in precarious employment, uh, and also known as the fissured workplace. These kinds of employment relationships mean that companies can take labor costs off of their balance sheet, but they do not reduce the risks and in some ways may be elevating the risks associated with poor human capital management. In order to evaluate these risks, investors need better workforce disclosure across companies' entire footprint. And this is a key feature of SHARE's engagement with companies and to many of the proposals that we will be talking about here today. I also wanted to talk a little bit about how investor interest is shifting. And we're certainly starting to see uh, real momentum in terms of the number of investors that are really starting to put decent work and human capital management on their list of top priorities uh, in their engagements with companies in particular. Uh, so we may have felt lonely uh, three years ago in raising these issues with companies, uh, but that is certainly no longer the case, as you can see with just some examples uh, provided here in this slide. So the Workforce Disclosure Initiative, or the WDI, for example, just two years after its launch has more than 120 investors with $13 trillion in assets under management, calling on global companies to respond to the annual WDI survey. This year, the WDI leadership uh, the WDI with leadership from SHARE in Canada will be asking all of the TSX 60 companies to enhance their workforce disclosure uh, through the WDI. 
some of you may uh, have also seen uh, Larry Fink's 2019 letter to companies. Uh, in that letter, BlackRock designated human capital management as one of its 2019 engagement priorities. Uh, we hope that means uh, BlackRock will also be voting in favor of some of the re resolutions that we'll be talking about today. I also just want to shed light uh, and, and draw attention to the Human Capital Management Co Coalition, really a key leader in the U.S. pushing to elevate human capital management as a critical component in company performance. Uh, in particular, they have uh, led efforts asking the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission to adopt standards that would require listed companies to disclose information on human capital management policies, practices, and performance. Uh, and so those are just some examples of how we're seeing the sort of this really significant sea change uh, in terms of investor interest uh, in decent work and human capital management. So what's driving uh, investor attention in decent work and human capital management? And really, I just wanted to touch on this briefly. And I think there really are three key drivers. The first is a company's workforce is a fundamental asset and key to its long-term success. So there's growing evidence uh, and recognition around the materiality of, of human capital management and recognition from, from investors uh, that a company's workforce and, and its approach to human capital is actually quite critical. Second, I think there's growing uh, acknowledgement that poor employment and workplace practices are a source of reputational, operational, and other types of risks that can actually lead to business risk and have financial consequences. Um, and, and, and we've seen uh, demonstration and evidence of that. And finally, I think uh, the bigger piece at the, the system, systems level is really recognition that growing income inequality can lead to weak and unstable social and economic systems and therefore really negatively impact investment performance across portfolios and over time. Uh, so those are really, I think, the three primary uh, drivers um, for investor interest uh, in, in decent work and human capital. So, I would like to turn it now over to uh, my colleague, Hugues Letourneau, uh, to talk a little bit about some of the uh, proposals that he has led. And one of the key themes um, that we have brought forward to companies uh, in our engagements is around enhanced workforce disclosure, um, uh, both in direct operations and also uh, in supply chains. Um, and we've talked about enhanced due diligence, for example, and remedy across operations. So, Oog, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the proposal that was brought forward by the Catherine Donnelly Foundation with the support of SHARE at Two Magnet International? Um, what was the proposal and, and why did you decide to file it? Sure. So thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Shannon, and uh, happy to, to uh, say a few words about the uh, the content of the proposal and uh, why we brought it forward. Um, so what is the proposal asking? I, um, As you might have seen, there's a, a proxy alert that has been circulated. If you have not, uh, certainly everyone in this webinar will be um, it will be circulated to everyone on the webinar after. But essentially what we are asking in this proposal is for um, more um, key performance indicators um, around the company's uh, human capital management and human rights due diligence as well, um, both in the company's global manufacturing sites and in its supply chain. So. Precisely, we're asking the company within its global manufacturing sites to provide um, some comprehensive workforce metrics that would include the number of temporary workers at Magnus manufacturing sites, um, turnover figures as well, uh, health and safety KPIs, and uh, responsible uh, labor recruitment um, measures. And we're also asking them to provide us 
more data on the number and types of complaints that they receive through uh, their grievance uh, mechanism. So that's for the company's global manufacturing site. I'm going to come back to explain um, why Magna is relatively um, unique in the regard to um, its 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 employment footprint as a manufacturing firm. And within the global supply chain, we're asking for some pretty standard information that we see more and more across uh, corporate disclosures. So KPIs on the number of supplier audits that have been conducted and the most salient human rights risks that have been identified and the, the corrective measures that have been implemented to avoid um, adverse human rights um, impacts. And we're also providing the company with uh, a relative amount of, um, of, uh, of choice with respect to the reporting framework that they would like to use. So we cited, for instance, the Global Reporting Initiative, um, the Workforce Disclosure Initiative, and we also encourage the company to um, use guidance from, from industry initiatives such as the Automotive Industry um, Action Group. So, so we, we are allowing for the company to um, not feel constrained to simply choose one reporting framework and um, so we're, we're providing that choice to the company. So that's, that's the what. This is what, what we're asking the company. Now, why are we asking um, Magna for this information. So Magna, if you think about Canadian companies, um, it, it is really one of the largest um, employers. It has 174,000 employees across 348 manufacturing sites in, um, in 28 countries. Uh, so in the next slide, I'm going to show you um, where the workforce is um, located. So Magna is not only Canada's largest um, auto parts supplier, it's also the world's third largest car parts um, supplier. So as we started doing some research on Magna, um, we did find some key gaps relative to um, Magna's global peers. Um, so some of the largest global peers, um, Continental, which is a tire um, manufacturer based in Germany, um, Bosch as well is uh, also a global peer and um, if you look in this this table here that you see on the slide um, so this shows uh, from the Thomson Routers icon terminal uh, the social pillar score of Magna so th this is just to illustrate um, that Magna ranks as as relatively low in the ranking um, given that it's the world's uh, third largest auto parts manufacturer and it ranks uh, 15 on uh, social scores. So we've been engaging with Magna for around two years on these issues and we've been invoking um, a variety of arguments to push the company to improve its disclosures. Um, the company has not met our demands and our assessment is that its current disclosures do not assure investors that it effectively addresses workforce related issues. As we're saying, why should we expect more from Magna? Well, it's a highly profitable company. Um, it's the world's lar third largest car parts supplier. And as I was mentioning, it has a very large um, employment footprint across the globe. So in this slide here, I've put up some numbers around where Magna employees are located. And on this map, you can see, uh, this is from um, Penn, Penn State University. Actually, some scholars there have come up with a map of um, human rights violations, risks, both in the law and in practice. So this is seen as a very uh, reliable um, indicator of uh, risks um, to, to workers' rights. So Magna's largest workforce, European Union, many countries in the EU, uh, the second largest is in um, Mexico and uh, the US and then China. And if you look on this map, you're going to see that um, it, this little um, 
pin here. Um, so China really ranks among one of the worst countries in terms of the protection of workers. So this is this is an important concern when we when we consider um, the risks to uh, Magna's workforce. And actually, the the, the precise number is that 33% of Magna's workforce is located in countries where um, workers have actually no guarantees of rights. So we find that to be to, to be concerning, and we think that it does warrant um, more disclosure to better understand things like um, how Magna really values it, its workforce, right? So some of the risks that, that we've identified through a pretty exhaustive scan of workers' rights issues in the automotive industry in countries where Magna operates um, are the following. So there are some health and safety risks. Um, for instance, in India, there's uh, thousands of workers that lose uh, fingers and hands every year in the auto supply chain. Um, so Magna has a has a growing presence in in India. Uh, in China, the auto sector workers are disproportionately affected by musculoskeletal disease, and this partly stems from the ignorance of management uh, on the issue and also the lack of worker voice. Uh, if we go back to um, the uh, the chart that you were presenting earlier today, Shannon. There's also the topic of short-term contractors, and this sends us back to asking for figures on uh, permanent versus temporary workers in the company's workforce. So in, in India, it's one of the risks that tends to come out in the auto sector. Uh, there is a, uh, a heavy reliance on short-term subcontractors and um, I, I have some some articles actually of you know workers that work in very precarious um, conditions in um, basements with very poor health and safety um, conditions obviously in Mexico as well which is uh, the Magna's second largest uh, employment footprint there are numerous reports of of the gaps in working conditions um, one of the articles that that I have from uh, from a Harvard publication talks about grueling and exploitative uh, con working conditions in the auto industry. So this is definitely of concern. Freedom of association as well. If we think, if we look at uh, Thailand, where Magna has a a smaller footprint, but just to um, to illustrate, um, two years ago, uh, a a complaint was filed. Um, under the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. And the complaint was filed towards uh, Suzuki and it related to um, the violation of freedom of association in, in um, Thailand. So, so these are some of the risks that we see um, where Magna is, um, has um, an employment footprint across the globe. And just as a reminder, what what we've the reason why we've been asking Magna for the added disclosure is that while the company has been good at providing the qualitative the the, the policy framework that it um, that it implements, it it has failed to provide to us or to demonstrate in its disclosures some some actual numbers that would um, validate its approach. So that's, that's, the, that's the what we're asking Magna and why we're asking the company. Great, thank you, Oog. Um, maybe just a, a quick follow-up question. Um, I know in the proxy circular, Magna um, uh, has put forward uh, the argument that it does in fact provide sufficient disclosure. Can you just talk a little bit about um, uh, more about your response to that uh, and and where you see the gaps uh, for the investors on the on the webinar today? Sure. So this is something that's obviously available for everyone to look at in uh, the company's um, proxy circular. One of the things that it cites is its uh, decentralized operating structure. So if anything, in our view, a, um, a decentralized operating stru structure could lead to a, a lack of effective 
circulation of information around workforce data. So we think that it, if anything, it it stresses the importance of of uh, having executive management and having the board um, have a good um, handle of, of potential issues in its uh, work site. And also to consider, I guess, um, you know, topics such as uh, employee productivity, um, employee retention, and of course, like valuing the workforce, as we were saying. So we think that the company basically citing its decentralized operating structure um, does not allow for for investors to appraise the the composition of of it its workforce, and to understand how this fits with um, Magna's approach of what we call fair fair enterprise um, culture. As as I was mentioning on the workforce indicators, Magna lags um, its um, its global peers. Uh, so lack of data on turnover, um, workforce comp composition, which uh, inhibits the ability to assess how the company values its workforce. And some of its competitors, such as uh, the German company Bosch, for instance, discloses this data um, and has been doing so for a number of years. Furthermore, there, there is actually no disclosure of um, the accident rates at Magna. So we, we think that in, in a manufacturing context, it's absolutely crucial for a company to be able to provide some numbers, right? It could be around accident rates. It could be around uh, fatalities as well, because these are, um, in some cases, dangerous uh, workplaces. And the company also argues that um, with respect to the supply chain, the, the risks of disclosure exceed any potential benefit. So, so f f for this, as, as we were asking a little bit earlier, we're asking for the number of audits uh, conducted and some of the main findings or some of the main risks that were identified because the company, of course, um, has suppliers in each of the countries where it operates. So in, in my view, essentially, and what, what I've seen in, in, um, in similar disclosures is that if a company effectively manages key supply chain human rights risks, um, the company would conclude otherwise. Uh, for instance, so Magna's largest clients disclose such information. Uh, BMW discloses the types of issues raised through, through its grievance mechanism. And uh, Fiat Chrysler also discloses the summary of results of supplier assessments. And uh, again, going back to Bosch, Bosch discloses the number of audits completed at supplier. So it, it's basically these data gaps, which in our view um, and our experience engaging with Magna uh, fail to demonstrate the effective, again, I use this term like circulation of human rights and human capital information from the supply chain to the individual manufacturing operations and from the manufacturing operations to the head office and the board of directors. And one instance, just to highlight um, some of the, the, the evidence, I guess, that we found of possible human rights risks at China is uh, it's through through a scan of different uh, websites and publications. And here the source is the China Labor Bulletin. And it's basically these workers that put up pictures of um, um, protests that uh, took place in October 2018. So there were workers at a Magna factory in Shangzhou, China, pro protesting a restructuring, and um, they were there were some arrests. And the allegation was that the police arrested 48 employees, including pregnant women. So if we think about the Canadian context, obviously it's very rare that you would see police lined up like that in front of a factory and uh, workers being arrested. So I, I, I think again that this this calls to for for investors to understand how something like this, which which we we don't know if this is an isolated case or if it happens um, frequently, 
but for something like this to make its way back to head office and for the board of directors to be notified of um, of such issues is um, is what we 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 do not really understand that magna is doing right now so for these reasons we um we we disagree with um um magna's arguments in the uh, management circular okay um Great, thank you, Oog. Um, so I would like to turn it over now uh, to Delaney and talk about uh, uh, two other proposals, um, Delaney, that you uh, led. Um, one uh, to Dollarama um, and the other to um, Restaurant Brands International. Um, can you tell us about, let's start with Dollarama. Can you tell us about that proposal? Um, I understand that was filed by the United Church of Canada Pension Plan uh, with shared support. Uh, what is the proposal asking for and why did uh, you decide to file it? Um, sure, so first two preliminary things. Um, neither of these proposals are as far along as the Magna one is, so there we don't have a, um, management circular out with the response yet um, and I should also say that I can't take sole credit for this work um, the my colleagues uh, Sarah Couturier Tano and Kevin Thomas have been um, worked on a lot of work on Dollarama as well um, so the proposal we found it at Dollarama um, uh, this is as the name sounds a dollar store company that's um, ubiquitous in Canada I would say um, and they provide, uh, we've asked for a report to shareholders detailing the due diligence process um, used by the company to identify risks um, to human rights from its business. And we're talking about both direct business operations, but also um, critically the supply chain. Um, and so the requests, the details of the requests match very closely with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, so we've asked how the company identifies risk to human rights, uh, root causes of uh, abuse human rights impacts, integrates that finding in decision making and action to prevent and mitigate adverse human rights impacts, um, tracks effectiveness of these measures and remedies any um, adverse impacts that it causes or contributes to. Um, so that is, as those that are familiar with the UN guiding principles, it's very similar. Um, to the language there. And I guess the reason that we decided to file this proposal um, is because we've actually been engaging with the company for many years on supply chain human rights issues. And we've had some progress, but that progress seems to have stalled out. Um, and this is despite the salience of this issue. Um, so the company's products are um, very uh, low cost. Um, consumer goods, um, sourcing from, a, similar to Magna, a um, large part of its sourcing comes from China in particular, um, as well as other countries, mostly in, in Asia, um, where worker uh, rights are not as strong and there's uh, documented evidence of um, issues with human rights, such as forced labor and child labor in supply chains. Um, so, but I think in addition to this concern about the impact to other people's rights, there's also a concern about um, the impact to the company that finding human rights abuses in the supply chain would have um, on its, its, its success. Um, if consumers, because they are a consumer facing company, were to see evidence of, of their products being made in these conditions. Um, and so I think one example of that that hasn't been linked to Dollarama, I should be clear, is a couple of years ago, um, there was a widespread news reports about this uh, area that's being dubbed a Christmas village in China where people were, were working to produce um, mass amounts of low cost Christmas decor, decorations and, and products. Um, and their working conditions were um, very poor, very un unsafe, unsanitary, um, extremely long hours, and other issues like that. And so these are similar to the types of products that Dollarim sells. 
Um, and I'm not saying that they were linked with that situation, but we just don't have any information out of the company um, to know what it's doing. So I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Delaney. Maybe just a quick follow-up question um, along the lines of, uh, of the discussion we were having uh, around Magna, which is just to tell us a bit more about the current state of the company's disclosure and uh, uh, related to its uh, decent work and supply chain, uh, and where are the, the key gaps that you see um, as being fundamental in terms of information that investors really need? Mm -hmm. So I think, so okay, so a few years ago um, after some, some of our first engagement with the company, um, Dollarama adopted a vendor code of conduct um, to address human rights violations in the supply chain and the code is now available on the company website um, but it is quite weak. Um, it doesn't address any implementation aspects um, and it, it's not accompanied accompanied by any um, commitments from the company as to how it will, how it implements the code or its own policy on approaches to, these, to human rights in the supply chain. Um, and so one example there is that the code doesn't address recruitment fees. And as some of you may know, um, recruitment fees are a key issue that in, so when, when workers are required to pay in order to get a job or to get to a place for a job. Um, this is often a precursor to forced or bonded labor situations. So that's omitted from the, the code. And then I would say in addition, um, they, they don't have any uh, broader ESG disclosure yet. Um, they, they are, our understanding is there's an intention to publish a first sustainability report this year but we don't know to what extent, uh, if at all, that's going to cover um, supply chain issues and also decent work in, in the company's own operations. Okay, great. Thank you, Delaney. I think that's really helpful. Um, and I, I think uh, it is interesting that you raise recruitment fees. Um, and, um, you know, we, we always thought of recruitment f for fees and these uh, exploitive labor recruitment practices happening sort of uh, only in supply chains but as we've seen from recent uh, media reports this kind of uh, th these kinds of practices are in fact um, happening uh, here in Canada as well and I think that's sort of a good timing to shift to hear a bit more about the proposal um, that you filed uh, this year with the Atkinson Foundation uh, to Restaurant Brands International. Um, and I think this proposal is particularly interesting as it speaks to the risks associated with human capital management in the context of a franchise model. Um, so can you tell us more about that proposal and what it's asking for and what led you to raise workplace issues with RBI? Sure, so I guess I'll start with the ask and then explain some of the background. Um, the ask is for the uh, company to provide a report to shareholders on actions it is taking to ensure um, decent work practices in its franchisee operations. Um, and so it's, ask, it's asking about minimum requirements and standards around wage, what it's, sorry, we're not being prescriptive, we're not telling them what standards to have, we're asking what the standards are around wages and benefits, working hours, health and safety, things like this for its own corporate offices and, and franchise operations, as well as any programs and activities um, and operational management to support franchisees in having good workforce practices um, and performance indicators that are used in association with that. So um, Restaurant Brands is an interesting company because it is uh, a fast food company, but it operates through a franchise model. Restaurant Brands uh, has uh, Tim Hortons, Burger King, and um, Popeye as three uh, restaurants that it up the banners that it owns um, and then most of those reference are ref restaurants are operated by um, franchisees who are licensed to use uh, the banner and product um, in 2018 a 
as many may know, there was a minimum wage hike in Ontario, um, where I am, and in response, uh, so I should say that Tim Hortons is all over the place in Ontario, every corner has a Tim Hortons on it, um, but in response, some franchisees cut back on breaks and other benefits, um, on offloaded some expenses to, to workers in response to the minimum wage hikes, um, some of which was benefits that were provided voluntarily, but some of which was um, actually minimum, wage, minimum employment standards. Um, and so when asked to comment on this situation, the RBI made very clear that it is um, separate, distinct from the franchisees who are the employer, um, but it expects them to have uh, good workplace practices. And then in parallel with this, there's a, been widespread media reports in all RBI operations about uh, um, across RBI brands, restaurant brands, brands um, about costs being pushed down from the parent company to franchisees um, and difficulties in those relationships between franchisees and the parent company um, related to quality of product and expenses. And so um, that leads one to wonder how work, uh, how the parent company, how, what role it has in ensuring decent work practices um, as a company in the business of fast food. Um, a key asset is the value of the brand, their brand's reputation, and so the welfare of frontline workers is critical to its success. So this is kind of the backdrop that led us to engage with our VI on the issue and then ultimately file a proposal. Okay, that's great. I think it's also just interesting to note that um, RBI does um, argue and, and make claims in its own uh, reporting, particularly its sustainability reporting, that its uh, workforce are a, a fundamental asset to its success, of course. Um, and so it does raise the question of how they're ensuring that they're protecting that key asset, um, even through their, their franchise model. Um, I guess one final question, Delaney, um, will this proposal be going to a vote? Um, we don't know yet. <laughs> We're mm -hmm. in discussion still with the company, but the um, deadline is approaching soon. Um, and so we're hoping that there that um, that we can work something out. It might we might not be able to. And I just wanted to say that I think there it, there's in, it's interesting the company's pushback because there is some legal concern about mm -hmm. RBI overstepping um, or being considered a de facto employer. But there's a lot of room uh, for standard setting and uh, guidance um, and, and support and monitoring um, that before you get to that point of being considered a direct employer. And that's where we're looking to see action. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I do have just a, another question for you, Delaney, um, but I wanted to just mention I am seeing some questions coming through um, around Magna. That's great. So keep sending your questions again. You can type them into the chat box, which is on um, the GoToWebinar um, panel on the bottom right-hand side uh, where it says chat. You can um, type in your questions there. So uh, keep those coming. But I did want to, uh, to go back to you, Delaney, because when we talk about precarious employment practices in the fissured workplace, um, we know that these are not issues only affecting sectors like a retail and fast food. Um, and uh, I understand that the Atkinson Foundation also filed a re resolution at the Royal Bank of Canada uh, addressing its workforce composition and, and due diligence. Um, can you tell us briefly about that resolution? And I, uh, the resolution, I understand, was withdrawn um, but what was the basis of, of the withdrawal? Are you there, Delaney? Oh, I think maybe she um, dropped off. Um, so we'll come back to that. Um, um, uh, come back to that question, um, but I can uh, move on to uh, talking to Oog a little bit um, about um, 
a resolution that you filed uh, and you also had success in terms of being able to withdraw it at Amazon. Um, and I understand that resolution uh, was filed on behalf of Share's client, the Sisters uh, of Mercy of Newfoundland, um, together with the AFL-CIO Reserve Fund. Um, can you tell us about that resolution uh, and what the result of your engagement with Amazon was? Sure. So we filed a resolution um, asking Amazon to, to add a, um, a specific characteristic to the criteria that they consider when they recruit new board members. And the characteristic that we added is experience dealing with workforce issues. We call this uh, human capital um, management. And we were asking the company again to just add human capital management as a skill that they look at when they recruit new board members, because that was not in their, their statutes and their corporate governance policy. And when um, we scanned the, um, the, the skill set of the current board of directors, we could not see like workforce, human resources, human rights, uh, human capital management as, as an experience that came across. We thought that this was pretty concerning because we, we, we can't really understate in this day and age how, how big Amazon is, I guess. It is the, um, the second largest employer in the US. Um, if you look at its disclosures as well around the, the pay ratio data, um, I believe the number there is uh, just under um, $30,000 US as the, the median pay for Magna employees. So that means that, that half of the employees of, of Magna are paid less than 30,000 um, US dollars. So, th and th this, this kind of adds on top of all of the coverage that came out around um, the, the workers' rights in warehouses, in um, the fulfillment centers, really like across the globe, there's been coverage on this. So we filed a resolution in collaboration, of course, with AFL Res CIO Reserve Fund. Uh, we had one phone call with Magna where we um, we we stressed uh, the importance with Amazon, yep. with Amazon, with Magna, with, with uh, Amazon. Yes, of course. Sorry. So um, yes. So everything that I've said over the last two minutes has been related to Amazon. Um, so we filed we filed uh, the resolution. We had a dialogue with um, Magna with uh, Amazon, excuse me, um, and we 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 stressed some of the the same arguments that you were um, making at the beginning, right? Around some of Amazon's largest investors actually um, considering human capital management as as a driver of value. BlackRock, of course, being one of those asset managers and BlackRock being one of the largest um, shareholders in, in Amazon. And uh, yeah, I mean, a few weeks later, uh, the company came back to us and they, they said that they had agreed to, to add, um, to, to act on our request. So they, they have now included um, human resource, human capital management as as an expertise that they look for for um, board members. So now what we look forward to doing after that is to track um, basically like the board's oversight around um, workforce management issues at Amazon, which is a company that, uh, that obviously just keeps growing in terms of um, its revenue and its, uh, its employment footprint um, around the globe. Okay, great. Ooh, that's good. Thank you for also telling us uh, a bit about what uh, you'll be looking at going forward, um, because I, I definitely think getting that kind of capacity on the board is really important, but it's certainly just a starting point. Um, I just want to, if Delaney is back with us, um, Delaney, are you um, able to hear me? I am for now. 
I am okay, for now. Well, let's cross our fingers. I was just asking you about uh, the resolution and conversations at the Royal Bank of Canada, because I do think um, that it's important to recognize that uh, the issues that we're seeing in terms of precarious employment and fissured workplaces are not just issues happening in retail and fast food, but in fact across industries uh, and occupations. Um, so can you tell us about that resolution and what the company uh, agreed to do? No, did you cut out again? Hmm. Okay, um, so um, we tried again um, unsuccessfully. Maybe I, I'll just talk a bit about uh, this resolution um, because it's something that we're looking at and, and engaging with a, a number of the banks in, in Canada about uh, and really looking at a, a stronger picture of um, workforce composition. Um, as some of you may know, in public accountability statements, um, banks are required to provide certain kinds of information uh, to demonstrate um, their broader commitment to responsibility. Um, and so that includes things like branch locations, for example. Um, and it also includes uh, their part-time and full-time employees. Um, but as we know, the, the nature uh, of employment uh, in the financial services industry has shifted um, quite radically. Uh, and so we were really looking for a sense of um, the contingent workforce that the bank um, is relying on, uh, and also a sense of uh, the due diligence processes that the banks have in place to deal with employee complaints uh, and grievances. And this really emerged as a result of some of the reports that uh, have come out around sales pressure um, at uh, banks uh, and that may be resulting in uh, inappropriate products um, being uh, offered and, and pushed on to clients um, and, and sort of what the workforce dimension of that is. Um, so we were really happy that uh, RBC has agreed to uh, expand its disclosure um, and in terms of its workforce composition to, to give us a sense of uh, its um, the number of temporary workers, for example, contract workers, um, as well as uh, uh, they have agreed to uh, also provide information on the number of grievances um, that are being raised by employees through various channels that are, are available. And so um, that was uh, in the RBC circular. Um, at the very end of the circular, you can see uh, the resolution that we filed as well as the agreement that we came to. Um, so. Uh, I just wanted to to mention um, that. Um, so moving on, which um, how are we doing for time? Um, I do actually want to open it up now to questions. Um, we do have um, some questions that have come through here, um, and um, I want to start. Uh, with a question for you, Oog, uh, regarding Magna. Has Magna said what risks it faces from disclosing data about its workforce? Sure, so back to Magna this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, what they said is uh, they, they listed four bullet points around um, how they balance out requests for information. Um, so very briefly, they say the cost benefit of gathering uh, data in the context of their decentralized model, uh, the impact of disclosure on their competitive pos position, and um, the extent to which they provide what they, what they call proprietary confidential sensitive information, and the likelihood of the information being used by parties which are adversarial to Magna. So to, to be, to be uh, perfectly transparent, when I when I read this, it reminds me of if we go back um, 15 or 20 years ago in the clothing and garment industry, um, before any company provided any transparency regarding their, their supply chain footprint, uh, these are the reasons that they would usually cite. Um, so proprietary um, issues with competitive position so I I don't I don't really agree that um, magna would 
um, would would try to uh, prevent disclosure based on these premises, particularly when uh, their their competitors are actually disclosing a lot of the data that we were asking for. For instance, um, so I, I mean, it's and it's listed right: the health and safety KPIs, the workforce metrics, and um, their uh, grievance mechanism metrics um, are all disclosed by some of their competitors. And I would invite folks to look at uh, the Bosch sustainability report if they are interested in uh, learning more. So those would be my, my two points. Just um, it, it sounds like a, a bit of an old outdated argument that, that used to be prevalent 20 or so years ago uh, that no longer is at a, at a point in time when BlackRock is asking for this type of information and uh, that Magnus competitors um, are indeed disclosing this, and as you might remember from the um, the table showing where Magna ranks in terms of its social rankings, um, that's another case in point with regards to why they they should not hold back from disclosing these data points. Great. Okay. Thank you, Ug, for responding to that. Um, and Delaney, I just want to see if you're back on. There is a question that uh, you would be best suited to, to answer. Um, yes, I, I am. Okay, it's a question regarding um, what the joint employer laws regulations are in Canada covering franchise operations, since you are our lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I am, but I, I'm not an employment lawyer, so I don't know the specific um, line. I do know that uh, franchisors, the parent the company, can provide guidance and standards um, and also do training for their um, franchisees, but I don't know the exact line of when they, I think if they were managing direct employees, it, then they might be getting into the um, crossing the line. Right. Um, yeah. And there's probably I mean, no case law. Is, uh, I haven't heard of any case law myself. Yeah, and I think um, we also don't know enough about what restaurant brands' current practices are to understand how much more they could do. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, I see, I think we have uh, one more question uh, that I see here, um, which is uh, comments from either of you actually in terms of what are some of the key features of strong workforce disclosure. So um, things that you're saying, for example, Ugi you mentioned the Bosch reporting that uh, you think are really, really strong. Um, if you can respond to that, that would be great. Yeah, well, I think, in, uh, again, just going back, since I, I've been talking about Magna and, and Amazon, but going back to Amazon, to, I'm sorry, I keep confusing both. Going back to Magna, which which has a very large directly employed workforce, right? Um, so we're not talking about supply chain only, we're talking about um, employees of the company around the globe. We we would like to better understand if something as simple as if there is stability in the workforce, right? So um, for how long are workers staying with the company? Um, if the company resorts extensively to uh, short-term contracts in India, in uh, China, I mean, this has an outcome on, um, I guess like looking at, at labor and workers as a key input into production processes, right? So having that data would give us the ability to assess if 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 it is indeed a concern and if, if the company is effectively um, valuing, training its um, its workforce to, to to I guess like to, to maximize um, the, the the benefits that it can get from um, a decent um, a decent workforce. Delaney, do you want to add anything to that in terms of what does strong workforce disclosure look like? Yeah, and I think it is 
difficult when you're talking about further down the supply chain or when you're talking about the franchisee. Um, but I, in those situations, it's understanding um, what the standards that the um, uh, the central company um, is looking for and also what they're doing to implement that. And I think that's often what's missing mm -hmm. is that we're hearing what we expect, um, but we're not hearing how you ensure that, that your suppliers or your franchisees understand that uh, and have the tools they need to implement it. And maybe also what is done to follow up to make sure that it has been done. Yeah, absolutely. I think we hear a lot about intentions um, and we see reporting on policies, um, but we certainly are not getting a strong picture of the um, effectiveness of those policies and the outcomes uh, of those policies. I think um, one of the reasons that um, SHARE is um, participating in and a partner to the Workforce Disclosure Initiative um, is because it really is uh, a, a reporting framework and the methodology is really looking at the entire employment footprint and I think capturing um, some of the blind spots that I talked about earlier um, in terms of um, um, in terms of temporary contract workers in terms of some of the places um, that we might not be getting data um, so I think we have time here for um, one more question one more minute so very briefly um, um, the question is with regards to international standards and norms relating to decent work. Um, Oog, this is probably best place for you to respond to. Uh, how do these kinds of international standards apply to investors? And if you can answer that within Very 45 briefly. seconds. <laughs> sure. So I, I just think it's important to always get the message across that um, investors also have a responsibility under international frameworks like the UN guiding principles for business and human rights and like the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Uh, what happens if they do not um, uphold their responsibilities? Well, a complaint can be filed against an investor that does not do effective due diligence in its portfolio whether it's a large position or whether it's a minority shareholder position does not matter the responsibility um, to do due diligence still stands so um, yeah so i think this 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 uh, applies to everyone most of the investors um, on this call if there's any more questions i'm more than happy to uh, to have a discussion um, offline after the webinar Great. So that brings us to a close. Uh, I want to thank everyone for participating and thanks again to our webinar sponsor, Van City, uh, and again to the ongoing support from the Atkinson Foundation. We will send a follow up email with uh, related proxy alerts from the votes, some of the votes that we spoke about today. Uh, we will also provide a link in that email where you can sign up to get future uh, proxy alerts from SHARE. Uh, I can say that uh, this was a snapshot of some of the resolution that we have filed so far, um, but there are more in the pipeline, which is great, uh, related to uh, decent work. Um, in the email we send, we will also provide the recording from this webinar uh, as well on our website. So. Hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thanks again for joining us. Feel free to reach out directly uh, to any of us on the call if you have any questions uh, about today's conversation. Thank you.